Chapter 6 of the Bhagavad Gita is called Dhyana Yoga. The earlier chapters spoke about Samkhya, Jhana, Karma, the different aspects of yoga. This chapter speaks about Dhyana. A very practical chapter with some good instructions. If you are a meditator, you should pay particular attention to this chapter. But all the chapters are naturally important. This chapter has some important points about practice. There are some instructions that anyone aspiring to attain something in meditation should be aware of. This chapter answers some important questions like what or what is sannyas? Who is a sannyasi? It defines sannyasa. Is meditation or dhyana for everybody? What is dhyana? What are the instructions, some basic instructions on how to practice dhyana? The word dhyana is a technical word as well as a general term. Very often the term dhyana is used in a general way, colloquially as well. It means simply attention, to pay attention. So, for example, in Hindi or in many of the local languages in India, you use the word dhyan in the sense of simply paying attention. From the Yoga Sutras, dhyana is the seventh step of ashtanga or the seventh limb of ashtanga. So there is a general way of referring to meditation as well as a more technical way. We are all used to the idea of these days of people saying, ah, oh, yeah, I'm practicing meditation. Oh, I've also been meditating. In fact, some people say, I meditate all the time. Or they say, I'm doing walking meditation. Or there is... Um, there are people who are saying things like, oh, I'm meditating upon the universe or, you know, in a more um, light sense, humorous way of, of using the term meditation. So, what is the approach of the Bhagavad Gita? In what sense is the word or the term meditation used here? It is definitely not used in a more general sense. It's not a colloquial term. It is a more specific term. So this particular chapter goes into some aspects that are very important for meditators. We begin with verse 1 and 2. The Blessed Lord said, Without resorting to the fruit of action, he who performs the action that needs to be done, he is a renunciate and a yogi, and not one who has renounced ritual fires, nor one who is actionless. That which is called renunciation, you should know that to be yoga. O Pandava, no one who has not renounced desires, can become a yogi. So we see from these two verses, they answer the question, what is sannyasa? Who is a sannyasi? It's a definition. Who is a yogi? It defines these terms. Time and again, I have been asked this question. Who is a yogi? Who is a sannyasi? What, what is sannyas? 
there's there are a lot of misunderstandings about these terms the word yogi for example is used very trivially these days especially here in the west a lot of people do not have a great deal of respect for this term they use the word as anybody who performs asana is a yogi that is not true in india people have more respect for the term yogi and would not use the word would not trivialize the word nor use it in a very trivial sense for anybody who's performing some sort of gymnastics so there are a lot of misunderstandings about these three terms sanyasa sanyasi and yogi and the first two verses of chapter 6 define this very clearly so what is sanyasa what is a sanyasi a sanyasi is the one who has renounce the desire he performs action that needs to be done without desiring the fruit of the action in a selfless manner he is not attached to the idea of a reward or a result that means he is not attached he is a detached person and he performs all his actions in a selfless manner naturally we all say but i cannot do that most of us say oh i cannot do that i want a result i want a reward in earlier sessions we have spoken about it and said think of a hobby that you like to do gardening going for walks long walks you do it simply because you love it there is no grand result you're going to get out of it there's no big reward waiting for you at the end of your walk you do it simply because you love it and that's the attitude that a yogi or a sanyasi has it clarifies here a renunciate and a yogi are basically one and the same it also specifies very clearly that somebody who renounces ritual fires somebody who's averse to rituals doesn't mean that he's a yogi just because he doesn't perform rituals or worship doesn't mean make him a yogi or a sanyasi one who sits around actionless claiming to be a sanyasi does not become a sanyasi it is the internal condition that is an important prerequisite and what is this internal condition it says very clearly one who has not renounced desires cannot be a yogi so yogi is one who has renounced the desires and renunciation is the same as yoga or sanyasa is the same as yoga for a lot of people that may sound strange because we have this idea especially in the west and in modern india as well yoga is gymnastics yoga is asanas and there are so many other strange connotations to that word that we have forgotten the true meaning of it yoga is union union of individual self with the universal self it's only the highest state of renunciation supreme renunciation param vairagya that is the state of union or yoga and so this is what the first two verses of chapter 6 very clearly define 
A sannyasi or a yogi is not somebody who merely renounces the objects. Tiaga, not just mere renunciation of the objects, but internal renunciation, who has renounced even the desire for those objects. So these two verses define this very clearly. Are there any questions, thoughts or comments with regard to these terms? Do you still require clarity about these terms, sannyas, yogi, sannyasi? Good. I think everybody seems to be clear in that case. We just continue. Since we talked about sannyas here, perhaps it, it's a good place to just briefly mention that the word sannyas in modern terms, this is the definition, of course, from the Bhagavad Gita, which is the original meaning. In modern times, sannyasi also refers to one who has taken vows, an oath of renouncing the three ishanas. There are three ishanas. Ishanas, the word isha, isha means desire. Three main desires that everyone has. One is the desire for offspring, sexual desire. The second is desire for um, property, ownership of land, house, etc. And the third is um, the desire for fame and name. And so, one who takes these vows and enters an order, an institution, becomes a monk or a swami, is also known as a sannyasi. This does not mean that this monk or swami has renounced all his desires. That would be merely tiaga, that first step of, of practicing that, what these vows tell us. These three ishanas means you do not have children, do not enjoy uh, sexual union, you do not um, keep private property or, um, uh, or wealth, do not desire wealth, and fame, name, success, worldly success. So such a person is also called a sannyasi or a swami. But that is in more the modern times. And the true meaning of the term, of course, is internal renunciation, renunciation of the desire itself. Okay. Anybody needs clarification, comments to this? Good. In that case, we continue to verses 3 and 4. These three verses also answer very important questions. What is dhyana? What is meditation? Is meditation suitable for everyone? 
or is it a privilege of a few? The verses 3 and 4 say, For a meditator, Muni, desirous of ascending in yoga, action is said to be a supportive means. And when the same one has already risen in yoga, tranquility becomes his support. And he is no longer drawn to the objects of senses, nor to actions. Having renounced all volitions of desire, he is then called one who has ascended to yoga. So, if someone desires to ascend in yoga, ascending in yoga is to attain something, it doesn't mean that you are a witness, master of all. It means that you have attained some glimpses. So, if you desire to attain something, you can practice karma yoga, you know, learning to do your actions in a skillful manner so that these actions in this world does not become an obstacle. It means you organize your life in such a way that the world does not become an obstacle to you. And all your actions are flowing in harmony, well-coordinated and harmonious, which is a skill. And once you have attained some glimpses, you have already evolved. It means you have evolved further. Now, tranquility becomes your support. Meditation becomes your support. What does this mean? It means you can go further, deeper with meditation. It seems, therefore, that meditation may not be the right thing for everybody initially to start with. You may perhaps need to evolve a little bit, get some glimpses in, in the initial stages. Without these initial glimpses, the meditation may become a very uh, monotonous act. You're doing some practice, but the essence of the spirit may be lacking. So it seems that meditation is suitable for evolved soul, a jivatman that has evolved already, and such a jivatman that wants to fathom the depths of the mind gain further glimpses. Such an evolved person who's ascended to yoga would go deeper into meditation. Such a soul, such a jivatman, loses interest in the worldly objects. Having had those glimpses already, through leading a skillful life, selfless life, skillful life, he has attained a state where he finds that he, he gets no great pleasure from these worldly objects. He doesn't feel a need to perform all sorts of actions that worldly people perform. So the desire itself for doing these actions seems to have disappeared, renounced. It happened through a process of spiritual evolution, whether it happened in previous lives or in this life. The person has evolved, or to use the language used here, has ascended, you have ascended, elevated, elevated to a higher level. And such a person who has had these glimpses, has renounced 
naturally and spontaneously the attraction to these objects, worldly objects, is one who has ascended. Such a person is very suitable for meditation. So what is meditation? What is dhyana? Dhyana is when there is that flow and you have these deeper glimpses to the unconscious mind and to your true self within. One of the key sayings of Samaya Shri Vidya is Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam. This means don't impart, don't impart, don't impart. Do not impart this knowledge. Why not? It doesn't mean don't impart at all. What it means is do not impart to those who are not ready. Impart this only to those who have already evolved. The others need to be prepared. If you're not prepared, you need to be prepared. These verses explain this. That meditation is a privilege for those who have evolved or have been elevated and do not have such a great, deep interest in worldly objects, worldly desires. They have started to question these. Started to question the fact that that the world is not quite the way it looks. You begin to doubt that these worldly objects can satisfy you. So this person, this Jivatman, has evolved and is now ready for deeper meditation. Any thoughts, questions? Yes, Nicholas. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me, or is it very noisy? No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I was planning to ask is, uh, uh, obviously, we will have different experiences every day, every year. Uh, so. Uh, there's no one state that someone has in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, a Jivatman, as you say. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I was wondering, uh, is there any uh, theory behind all this? Like, what you do in life, life meditate from one lifetime to another? Uh, you know, you might be at the higher states in one lifetime and lower in another. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, generally... You can get yourself into the world or out of the world, depending on what happens around you. Maybe mm -hmm. it's all interconnected. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, generally, what happens is you evolve over time and lifetimes. A fall, a downfall, is rare since most of us do learn from our experiences and there's a continuous evolution taking place. A downfall from one who has already developed to sink 
back to a lower life form or to a less privileged uh, position is less likely. There's no great theory behind this. I mean, there, there, there have been experiences, there have been stories related to this. The theory um, does not really matter because how are you going to prove it anyway? The only way to prove this is to discover these truths in meditation. So the concept of evolution also exists in science, but this approach in spiritual evolution is through lifetimes. And of course there have been stories about people with reincarnation and past lives. And these are mysterious things. That's all I can say. They're mysterious things and uh, it's for each one to discover this truth for him or herself. Verses 5 and 6 are now beginning with the core of this chapter on dhyana. This, this is probably one of the, I could consider this one of the most important verses in the Bhagavad Gita. There are certain verses that I say these are red letter verses. They really are essential for people to understand and get and try to integrate this in your life. This is literally, I would say, step one in the meditation manual. Verses 5 and 6. One should cause the deliverance of the self by the self. One should not make the self sink. Self alone is the kinsman of the self. Self alone is the enemy of the self. Self is the kinsman of his self by whom the self is conquered by the self. In the apparent enmity from non-self, the self alone is operating like an enemy. It sounds confusing because there is the lower self and the higher self. The lower self is also known as the mind or the jiva. That's the vehicle. In modern terminology, we would say the unconscious mind. The samskaras that have been stored in the vehicle which is known as jiva. The higher self, capital S, the higher self is pure consciousness or Atman. So we try to understand this better by rereading this two verses. One should cause the deliverance of the lower self or mind by the higher self or Atman. One should not make the mind sink. Consciousness alone is the kinsman of the mind. Mind alone is the enemy of consciousness. Consciousness is the kinsman of his mind, by whom the mind is conquered by pure consciousness. In the apparent enmity from non-self, the self of your consciousness alone is operating like an enemy. The essence of these verses is the mind should be a friend and not your enemy. The mind is an instrument that you have. Just like the body is an instrument that you have, so is the mind. It is very popular among people who are in spiritual circles. If you read books, or you hear uh, modern day uh, yoga teachers talking, especially neo Advaita teachers, they will all say, oh, the mind is a mad monkey. The mind is the cause of all the problems. As if the mind were a bad thing. 
it is, if it is a bad thing, you're making the mind your enemy. So don't let that mind sink, it says. Don't let it sink into this animosity. Make the mind your friend. An untrained mind is definitely the enemy of consciousness or of Atman. So train the mind and make your mind your friend. The word bandhu is used for friend, friendship. The idea of putting down or condemning the mind comes mostly or mainly from this new Advaita teaching as well as from a common misinterpretation of these verses here where people think of the mind as something bad or evil. It is indeed true that the mind is very powerful. The mind is like a genie or, you know, a genie in a magic lamp. It's like a genie. It can make all sorts of things happen. If you give your genie evil things, you know, evil commands and the genie does evil things, is that the fault of the genie? No. If you tell the genie to do good things, the genie will do good things. So let your mind be trained, obedient, a well-trained mind is your friend. And a mind that's not trained will create obstacles will create misery for you. So learn to make your mind your friend. There's the only one mind you have and only one body. So these are your instruments. Take care of them because these are the same that will help you to, towards an enlightenment, towards further spiritual evolution. The Yoga Vashishta uses a beautiful example here. It resonates with these two verses beautifully. It says, to remove a thorn, you need a thorn. You know, the, some people to this day walk barefoot in India, in the villages, villagers walking bare feet. And sometimes a thorn gets stuck in the foot. And when the villagers don't have access to, you know, medical facilities or doctors and the thorn is stuck, what do you do? You don't have a scissor with you, you don't have, a, you know, any uh, thing with you. You can use another thorn to remove the thorn which is in your foot. So, using the thorn, you remove another thorn. Similarly, your mind will help you overcome the mind. And this is the meaning of these verses. This is the essence. Instead of condemning our minds, learn to develop a relationship with the mind, a positive relationship. One of the first steps in meditation is a practice called internal dialogue or Atma Vichara in which you learn to develop this relationship with the mind. Most of us do not know our own minds. We do not know what our, ourselves. We are strangers to ourselves. So just like you would meet a stranger somewhere, you introduce yourself, you get to know each other, then you're no longer strangers, then you're friends, eventually. That doesn't happen one day in one meeting. It happens over a period of time. Similarly, in meditation, you learn to develop this relationship with yourself, with your mind. And that doesn't happen in one, in one time, practicing Atma Vichara for one month or a given amount of prescribed time and you say, okay, I'm done with step one. That's not how it works. Like in real life relationships, 
which develop over a long period of time, you also need to invest in a relationship, right? You invest in your friendships, you invest time in your relationships, because you need to keep on working with this. So also with relationship with yourself, through meditation, through internal dialogue, learn to get to know yourself and work on this aspect of building up this relationship. Don't expect miracles. It's not going to happen in one meditation session. It's going to take a long time and over years. You learn to be comfortable with yourself, with your own mind. I will ask you a question which you should answer very honestly to yourself. How many of you can honestly and truthfully say, I like myself? Let the word sink in, let the question sink in. Do I like myself? Ask yourself this question. I'm quite sure that if you're really honest, most of you will probably say no. Or you might say, I don't even know myself. So there's a great need to focus on this step, the very first step in meditation. Questions? Any thoughts about these verses? Uh, so, Radhika ji, in in these verses, the self with the capital S, mm -hmm. uh, we can think of Buddhi as the representative of that self. No, that's not Buddhi. Buddhi is part of the lower self. Buddhi, you, it may, might be surprising to you naturally, Buddhi is the part that is closest to the higher self. It's the most sattvic part in us. It's closest to pure consciousness, but it is not pure consciousness. Buddhi is still a part of the lower self. It's still a part of the mind. But in the initial stages when we start internal dialogue, we're starting the process of being friends with our mind. And you can say that buddhi is the main representative in, in the mind. Imagine it this way. You meet a group of people. There are four of them. And by chance, their names happen to be Manas, Buddhi, Chitta and Ahankara. <laughs> and you want to get to know these four. And you say, hmm, um, Manas seems to be a very kind of distracted person. And, you know, you try to talk to him, but he doesn't really pay attention to you. You want to get to know him, but, you know, he's not really present. He's like all over the place. It's very difficult to get to know such a person, right? And he's not even paying attention. Ankara is a funny kind of fellow because he's kind of a little bit arrogant. And, you know, you find that uh, it's not so pleasant to talk to him. He's a very difficult person. Chitta is kind of busy. <laughs> He's a very busy person and uh, has a lot of stuff happening in his, you know, personality. And so out of these four, the most amicable one seems to be Buddha. You can at least have some sort of semblance of dialogue with Buddha. But all four of them are part of the mind. You can access buddhi a little bit more easily than the others. Does that make sense? Yeah, so is the um, ultimate aim of internal dialogue 
uh, is like a dialogue with the real self itself? The pure, pure consciousness, you actually cannot have a dialogue with pure consciousness. Yeah. Because you are pure consciousness. When you start, one aspect of the mind is having a dialogue with another aspect of the mind. But over time, what happens is you get to know all the different aspects of the mind. You train the mind. And by training your mind, coordinating these four, these four friends or strangers whom you met, you know, you get to know them better and you figure out that this chap called Buddhi, he seems to be a good leader, has some leadership qualities and he can sort of manage the other three quite well. So if they want to establish a task, then Buddhi is the one who, who kind of does things, you know, or gets things done. He's a leadership qualities. So you organize all four of them into a team. Now you have developed a kind of a team where they are positively working together rather than creating problems for each other. If they want to accomplish a goal earlier, Manas would have just gone off somewhere in a very distracted way. Uh, Ahankara would have said, oh, we're going to only do it my way or the highway. Chitta would have been busy doing all sorts of things, was a little bit preoccupied with his own past lives and, you know, whatnot. And Buddhi is struggling to get all of them together. And when he manages to get them all going together, you have established a relationship with your mind. You've got to know all the aspects of your mind. You become friends with the mind. Then the mind is no longer an obstacle. So the mind is then a true instrument. It's no longer creating problems. Then the internal dialogue takes a different quality altogether. It's no longer got this quality of resolving conflicts, etc. It seems to be almost that all of life becomes a dialogue where the mind is relating to the universe and another part of you, which is the true higher self, is merely witnessing, merely, in inverted commas, the higher self is witnessing and you are then identified with that aspect. It's always difficult with words, you know. We are, language itself is dualistic, so to understand a non-dualistic state is different. You cannot have a dialogue with the self. It is the subject. It's all right if you don't understand that entirely, just let that sit there. Yeah, I think it'll take some time to, you know, get good terms yeah. with uh, the real meaning of yeah. these words because I found it difficult to understand these two. Yes. Uh, part of the reason is, uh, again, the translation. And that's why I said the essence of the verses is far more important. And the essence is basically make the mind your friend. A mind that's your enemy creates obstacles for you Make your mind your friend by training it in an appropriate manner, by organizing your life in an appropriate manner so that you do not create obstacles for yourself. I'm sure that all of you here have met people who create a lot of chaos in their own lives. They make their lives very complicated. This most simple thing becomes so complicated and you know, wonder, hmm, how did this happen? All of us have met somebody like that. And that's a bit what the mind does, you know. A mind that's not well trained creates obstacles. Even if you don't really want those obstacles, you just end up creating them. Because that becomes the nature of the mind, you know. It's full of conflicts. There are a lot of internal conflicts. For example... If you want to do well in your exams and Manas is distracted, doesn't study. 
you know ego says oh i want to be first in class but manas is not cooperating you know buddhi says hey be be realistic you don't have you know that the qualities to be first in class be realistic don't push yourself too much and these kind of conflicts you know can create create issues in your life somebody for example who simply does not have that what it takes to be a brilliant student uh needs to also accept that that you know in life uh, maybe he's got other qualities so this mind management or training of the different aspects is the first step if the mind is creating obstacles you are not going to get further okay okay i just want to um say shortly here uh, an announcement the next two sessions the next two fridays uh, i have to unfortunately cancel the bhagavad gita session on both the two coming fridays i will also make this announcement in the facebook group but just so that you know we do not have bhagavad gita sessions the next two fridays Okay, verses seven to nine say, "The supreme self of one pacified and self-conquered is harmonized in cold and heat, pleasure and pain, as well as in honor and dishonor. His self, satiated by knowledge and realization, absolute, having conquered the senses, joined in yoga, he is called a yogi." be holding a lump of clay stone or nugget of gold alike one is distinguished who holds the same view toward an affectionate friend an enemy a stranger a neutral person one hated a kinsman toward the saintly as well as the sinful the essence of these verses is that one who has attained the supreme self sees all witnesses all as one one pure consciousness so he is in harmony or he is in sync with nature whether it's cold or hot whether there's pleasure or pain he whether there's a stone or a lump of clay or gold to him he only sees pure consciousness whether there's a friend or an enemy also he has a even mind towards these because he is established in pure consciousness he is witnessing so this is the state of self realization when you attain the self your fr- when your the mind becomes your friend and you eventually attain self realization this is how a self realized being is is one who sees all as pure consciousness this is not an instruction of what you should do this is a description of that state it has come again and again in the bhagavad gita it will come again later as well it is repeated to emphasize to reiterate the state of the witness of the self realized one these are not instructions of how you should behave or what you should try to do this is that state that you all aspire to attain while these verses 7 to 9 are not instructions 
The following verses, 10 to 13, are indeed instructions on what to do. From verse 10 onwards, begin the more detailed instructions on dhyana. The yogi should incessantly place himself in yoga, dwelling in solitude, alone, his mind and self controlled, having no expectations, receiving no input into the senses. Placing one's stable seat in a clean place, neither too high nor too low, made of cloth, a black antelope skin, and kusha grass, one on top of the other. There, making the mind one-pointed with the mind, self and movement under control, sitting on the seat, one should practice yoga for self-purification. Holding the trunk, head and neck straight, unmoving and still, observing the point in front of the nose, and not looking in various directions. So that was verses 10 to 13. I want to start right at 10 to 13 and go into the details of it. These are specific instructions on how to create the right environment. Find a place where it is quiet, solitude where you can be alone, where you do not get too many input into the senses, not too many stimuli from outside. So we say for modern munis, modern meditators, find a place in your house, in your home, which is quiet, a corner where there's a little bit of solitude away from the action which is happening in your house. If you have children, don't make your meditation seat in your children's room. It's probably not a good idea to even have your meditation seat in the living room where there's probably a lot more movement. Find a corner somewhere. If you don't have a, an extra room, a spare room, in your bedroom, in a corner somewhere or if you have a little office room maybe somewhere in that room a corner where you can be alone where you can just close the door shut out the world for a while and retreat we don't have to go to the himalayas for retreats the himalayan retreats are also very nice to do once in a while but you can have your retreat every day if you just have a nice little corner in your house, in your home, where you have a seat, a stable seat. Why stable? Well, you don't want to have a seat which is uncomfortable, where you're shaking all the time and moving all the time. So a seat in a clean place, a nice room which is airy and clean and neat, the seat should be not too high, not too low. This is of course referring to the times where uh, some wandering sannyasis would, uh, would you know, uh, be very low, then there would be um, insects, etc. or, or other um, things like snakes that, that might have disturbed them and uh, Therefore, referring to neither too high nor too low. This is made of cloth, or antelope skin, kusha grass. These are things so that you can sit on the floor uh, and have insulation. Remember that the wandering yogis, even in the months of winter, sat on the, sitting on the bare ground, which would be very hard and very cold. And uh, 
that is, upsets the energy balance in the body itself and of course would cause a great deal of distraction and discomfort. So also, if you sit at home, even in the comfort of your home, have a seat that is well insulated. So a woolen blanket, you know, a seat out of wool or silk. If some of you wish to use animal skin, the Bhagavad Gita doesn't seem to have a problem with it. Uh, Kushagras, I think, is not necessary anymore. <laughs> and making a comfortable seat for yourself, you can sit there, make your mind one-pointed. What is one-pointed? One-pointed means basically making your mind your friend. As I said, there are different aspects of the mind, manas, buddhi, chitta, and ankara. When these are in conflict, obviously, that's not friendship. So, making the mind one point, where all the four are harmoniously well coordinated, moving in the same direction, having the same purpose, like a team, a team that has a goal is successful. I like to use the example of sports, in sports and team sports, one team against the other, whether it's cricket or football or any other game, all the members of the team work together for one purpose. They want to win. If one member of the team wants to be a superstar, is not playing as a team member, that may cause problems. That's not the spirit in which one plays in teams. So, making your mind a friend, making the mind one-pointed, is one and the same thing. When the mind is well-coordinated, you will not be moving so much because the mind itself does not move so much. What is a moving mind? A mind that moves is one where there are a lot of conflicts. Manas is in one direction, wanting to go outwards. Ahankara is on his own trip. Chitta floods you with memories and emotions and fears and desires. Buddhi is simply not heard. The others are so loud that the gentle, sweet voice of Buddhi is simply not heard. That is a mind which is moving a lot. And that moving mind is reflected in a moving body. So if you want to sit still, you need to develop a relationship with the mind. As well as, of course, train your body to sit still. When you are able to do this, you are beginning to practice self-purification. Learning to allow the samskaras to come forward and let them pass. And now comes verse 13. Again, one of those red letter verses where we say, holding the trunk, head and neck straight. This is a very important instruction. Samam kaya shira grevam. Kaya is the body or the trunk. Shira is the head. Grivam is the neck. So keeping the head, neck and trunk, trunk aligned. And don't move. Be still. Observe the point in front of the nose. That is in Sanskrit, Nasikagre. Nasikagre has been interpreted in many ways. Here itself, you see, it's a bit misleading. It says point in front of the nose. Now, that can mean many things. Does it mean the point on the wall which is exactly in front of my nose? Does it mean the tip of my nose? What does it mean? We say Nasikagre is 
that point between the nostrils at the bridge of the nose that is nasikagre and observing does not mean with the eyes so that you become cockeyed if you try to do that you know you your both your eyes trying to look at that point between the two nostrils if you try to do that then you you'd be looking cockeyed if you try to hold that your eyes will start paining you cannot meditate like this so it means observing this point between the nostrils with the eye of the mind simply paying attention and not looking in various directions means to not get distracted pay attention to that point between the two nostrils nasikagre that is known also as simply as sandhya the wedding of the sun and the moon this point between the two nostrils all right any comments on these instructions these very specific instructions you can see an absolute agreement with our tradition three steps basically um given here very clearly step 1 make friends with your mind step 2 head neck trunk aligned and step 3 observe the flow of the breath between the two nostrils any questions on this Really, in this kind of day and age, is there really an advantage to using an animal skin? Well, I myself use sheep skin, and I have found it to be uh, much better than wool because of the insulation that animal skin provides. Perhaps in the early stages, it's not so important, and. it might get more important with time when you become more sensitive to very slight changes in the energy you know you simply become more sensitive the mind of the yogi is like as sensitive as the eyeball so when you develop that kinds of kind of sensitivity then it is probably useful to have um, animal skin but otherwise not you could instead use something synthetic which also provides that insulation but i find that synthetic materials though they provide insulation um don't feel so good so you could make an op- a kind of a layered seat where you have a synthetic insulation right down and then have just plain wool or silk or even cotton and then silk or so so that you don't if you don't want to use animal skin if you have uh, ethical issues with that okay mm-hmm. <coughs> okay anyone else In that case, we stop here with this session. And as I mentioned, that the next two Fridays we are taking a break, and uh, I will put this up in the group, and uh, so so that you get a reminder. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.
bye